A 24,000 square foot house sits in the Santa Clara Valley, just south of the San Francisco Bay. It takes up the amount of space five houses could fit into, and happens to be one of the most haunted places in the world, according to Time Magazine. It's an estate that has become infamous for its corridors and stairways that lead to nowhere, an architecture that is beyond rational explanation. With a reclusive, mysterious heiress, the house illustrates her fascination with the occult, ghosts, and rituals that took place in the house at the turn of the last century. Its history is tied to the Civil War, a vast fortune, and one of the most mysterious secret societies in history. This is Winchester House. Welcome to Interstate Odyssey, the first and only podcast dedicated to uncovering the history of America's most beautiful and bizarre roadside attractions. Going coast to coast and everywhere in between, I'll tell you all about the iconic locations you know and love, and the hidden marvels just down the road. From government cover-ups, to satanic cults, to alien encounters, and real-life mermaids, you won't believe the stranger-than-fiction stories I've uncovered about these uniquely American places. Come along for the ride with the Ultimate Road Trip Podcast, and join the adventure on your very own interstate odyssey. All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors, the phantoms on their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floors. We meet them at the doorway, on the stairs, along the passages they come and go, impalpable impressions on the air. A sense of something moving. That's the voice of Lillian Gish, silent film star of the early 1900s, describing the Winchester House in a 1963 CBS News documentary. From the moment this house began construction in 1884 to present day, the Winchester Mystery House has been a point of fascination in the development of the American West. A mourning widow who had lost her entire family but inherited millions chooses to build a sprawling house where construction is never finished in order to appease the lost souls that her fortune came from. Who was this woman? How did she amass this fortune? And, most curiously, why did she have such a fascination with hauntings and the occult? The woman who built Winchester House was Sarah Lockwood Pardee Winchester. Born in 1839, Sarah grew up in New Haven, Connecticut. She was from an upper-class family who had benefited handsomely off of her father's sales of ambulance carriages during the Civil War. Sarah was considered a child prodigy, being able to speak French, Latin, Spanish, and Italian from a young age. She was also a talented musician with a great knowledge of the classics. Think Homer and Shakespeare. She was generally considered by her contemporaries and those who knew her as a cultured, generous, and refined person. In 1862, she married William Wirt Winchester, only son and heir to the Winchester Repeating Rifle Company that his father, Oliver Winchester, founded in 1866. A little background on the Winchester Rifle. Oliver Fisher Winchester had begun his career in New Haven, Connecticut as a clothing manufacturer. While in that profession, he realized that a division of Smith & Wesson was failing financially, namely, their newly patented guns. Winchester took this opportunity, gathered venture capital from other stockholders, and acquired the S&W division that was known as the Volcanic Repeating Arms Company in 1855. The Volcanic Rifle was not ideal and performed poorly. An engineer, who now worked for Oliver Winchester, was Benjamin Tyler Henry, who improved the Volcanic Repeating Rifle by enlarging both the frame and the magazine, as well as newly redesigned 44 caliber rimfire cartridges. By 1860, this new design was known as the Henry Rifle. Then came the Winchester Rifle. 
After six years and 12,000 Henry rifles later, the company was reorganized and renamed by the Winchester Repeating Arms Company in 1866. The first Winchester rifle was called the Model 1866 and was an improved version of the Henry. Though repeating rifles were not popular during the Civil War, presumably because they were so new and untested, it became the preferred weapon of pioneers by the end of the 1800s, hence the nickname, the gun that won the West. So Oliver Winchester was worth a lot of money, like millions of dollars, which would be equivalent to hundreds of millions of dollars in 2020. In 1880, 20 years after Sarah and William Winchester were married, his father, Oliver Winchester, died of tuberculosis. That meant his ownership of the company went to his sole male heir, William. Tragically, a year after William inherited the company, he too died of tuberculosis, leaving Sarah a young widow. This was the second tragic death that Sarah had experienced in her short life. In 1866, when William was still alive, the couple had a daughter named Annie Pardee Winchester, who only lived for 42 days before succumbing to the infant disease Marasmus, characterized by severe malnutrition and an energy deficiency. By the time William died, Sarah was alone and in despair, but worth millions of dollars, and stood as the sole heiress of a massive fortune. But before she moved across the United States to the Santa Clara Valley, she decided to spend several years traveling Europe, where she could have very likely gotten exposure to secret societies, including groups like the Freemasons and Rosicrucians. In the United States, white men traditionally were the only people allowed to join secret societies like the Freemasons. In France, however, it was much more common for women to participate in these societies, as they were not explicitly forbidden from joining. To understand why Sarah was interested in these groups, I have to give you some background into what exactly these groups were all about. As someone who doesn't know a ton about secret societies of the 19th century, it seems like many of these groups were born out of a convergence of interest in the occult, esoteric knowledge, and spirituality, which kind of made this like a spicy, magical version of Christianity at the time. Sarah's upbringing in New Haven, Connecticut, close to Yale, was a hub for various fringe philosophies and theories, including Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. She also reportedly had several cousins and uncles who were active members of the Masons. But what the hell is a Rosicrucian? Rosicrucianism comes from the term the Rosy Cross, a symbol that was seen as early as the 10th and 11th centuries. Think Byzantine era. By the 17th century, occult philosophers took this theme and reframed it with the notion that the cavalry cross with a rose in its center was the original symbol of Rosicrucians, which arose from primordial tradition, or universal truths shared by ancient civilizations and empires throughout the globe. Rosicrucian manifestos were published throughout different countries, often centering around themes of spiritual transformation during times of great turmoil, a quest for esoteric knowledge, and a promise of revealing insights into nature, the physical universe, and the spiritual realm. Often, the manifestos combine elements and references to the Kabbalah, Hermeticism, alchemy, and Christian mysticism. By the late 19th century, aka when Sarah was alive, secret societies like this were becoming extremely popular. They had branched out into individual groups who had their own doctrines, rituals, and symbols. At that time, there were three main societies that branched out into even more groups. The big three included esoteric Rosicrucianism, which focused on explaining Christian inner teachings. Initiatory groups like the Golden Dawn, 
which was known for its famous members like Aleister Crowley and their explorations of the occult, metaphysics, and paranormal activities. And Masonic Rosicrucianism, derived from the stonemason fraternities of the 14th century, who described themselves as a, quote, beautiful system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. There's a ton of history and details that I'm probably leaving out about these societies, but what you really need to know is that the groups Sarah mixed with were likely the Masons and the initiatory groups like the Golden Dawn. So, like a mix of National Treasure and Harry Potter. These groups really valued symbolism and ritual, which could have lent to Sarah's inspiration to build elements like staircases that led to nowhere and the general labyrinth and quality of the Winchester House as well as her interest in seances and attempting to contact the dead. Sarah was also known for being obsessed with the number 13. Throughout the house, you'll often see things in sets of 7, 11, and especially 13 like 13 steps on a stair, 13 window panels in a room, and 13 sections of the house itself. Though this seems like it would be born out of a notion that Sarah was drawn to 13 because it's a curse number, the devil's number, or just plain unlucky, it could actually stem back to her exposure to these aforementioned secret societies and their proclivity for ciphers and occult symbolism. This obsession with 13 could have also very well been related to the phenomenon of apophenia, which is the tendency to mistakenly perceive meaningful connections between unrelated things. And technically, everyone experiences this from time to time, you know, finding patterns where they don't exist, but some experience it at a higher volume than others, often making them particularly interested in secret societies, esoterica, and conspiracy theories. Plus, from what I've read, Sarah just generally seemed really smart and interested in all sorts of different things, and since these things specifically were so in vogue at the time, it's likely she had heard a lot about this stuff. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Before I go too far down a secret society rabbit hole, let's get into the house itself. Construction of walls, floors, windows, and doors. Many of the stairs only rise 13 steps before ending up at a wall. Surely it must have been a fear of the unknown that guided the building of such a house. After Sarah returned to the United States from her travels abroad, she moved to the Santa Clara Valley and purchased 44 acres of land and an eight-room house that was in the midst of construction a whole lot smaller than the 160-room, seven-story behemoth that it would eventually blossom into. On the outside, the house's architecture was Queen Anne style, very traditionally Victorian looking. The inside was indicative of the aesthetic movement. This was popular when Sarah was alive and sought to place emphasis on aesthetic value over deeper meaning and was not known to be particularly utilitarian. Essentially, that was a fancy way of saying that this movement was one that wanted things to look pretty instead of functional or conceptual. Think steampunk-esque elements with lots of detail and ornamentation mixed with Japanese and Greek influences. The house is filled with intricate stained glass, most notably the 13 spiderweb window panes, and priceless original Tiffany glass panels. Asymmetrical motifs filled the home, with doors that were not so door-shaped but instead sloped and curved in different directions, and lavish elements like Lincrusta ceilings. For context, ceilings like these could also be found in places like the White House and the Titanic. A very overlooked element of this house was that there were some ingenious elements to it that really defined Sarah Winchester as an early adopter of new technology. Sarah had suffered from debilitating rheumatoid arthritis, and she wanted her house to accommodate her needs. In the late 1800s, it was all but unheard of for women to take showers. 
Instead, everyone usually just took baths. Since the movements of getting in and out of a bathtub were really difficult for Sarah, she designed her own state-of-the-art shower in her house, something that was not popular until decades later. The entire house was outfitted with steam and forced air heating, and featured indoor toilets and plumbing, as well as push-button gas lights. Of course, these all seem like things that are incredibly ordinary, but in the 1880s, they were downright revolutionary. She was reportedly earning upwards of $1,000 a day from the Winchester Company, so she was able to implement new and exciting innovations without budget coming into consideration. Another anachronistic feature was the call tube systems and bells that would notify servants where she was and what she needed. Even the fireplace was state-of-the-art, with funnel systems that drain the ash out of the fireplace into a pit in the basement. Like I mentioned before, the Winchester House wasn't just a curiosity because of its size or because of its innovations in architecture and technology, but instead because of the absolutely illogical, sprawling construction. Supposedly, after the death of her husband, Sarah was referred to a medium from Boston named Adam Coons. Now, during this time period, along with secret societies, seances and interest in psychics were at an all-time high. It's thought that because of the recent civil war and illnesses like typhoid, cholera, and the flu sweeping through the country helped to spur an interest in contacting the dead and communicating with spirits. Mary Todd Lincoln was known to be interested in all sorts of stuff like this, including attending seances. There's even a legend that in the late 1800s, the wealthy Stanford family held seances to contact their son who had just passed away. And allegedly, in one of those sessions, a spirit told them to build a school, bringing about the construction of a place you and I now know as Stanford University. Obviously, this is just folklore, but it nonetheless illustrates how prevalent spiritualism was in the late Victorian era. It's also eerily similar to Sarah's initial experience with the medium Adam Coons. The dead must really be interested in real estate because Sarah's dead husband, William, via the medium, communicated to Sarah that she would always be haunted by the souls that were lost at the hands of the Winchester rifle, and that their fortune would be forever cursed. The only way she could appease these spirits, he instructed, was to construct a home as a resting place for the lost souls and continually build upon it to accommodate the growing number of Winchester rifle victims. Also, if she ever stopped, she'd die. That was probably some pretty troubling news, but I suppose it maybe gave her something to focus on, so who knows. Either way, Sarah heeded her dead husband's wishes and began construction on the eight-bedroom house immediately. Construction seemingly never followed a concrete floor plan or blueprint, and she supposedly built the house in such a labyrinthine manner because it would aid her in avoiding more malevolent spirits who shared the space with her. Doors opened up to nothing, or into thin air, with a steep drop onto the lawn below. Also, Sarah was said to have slept in a different room each night to keep the ghosts even more off guard. As the construction of the house continued, outbuildings like the stables and barns eventually became connected to the main house. By 1888, staff was hired to tend to the ever-growing mansion, and Mary and Merriman, Sarah's favorite niece, moved in with her. She would continue to stay here for the next 15 years. Reportedly, Sarah Winchester very rarely spoke to her staff, but instead Marion would speak to them for her. A lot of gossip swirled around the staff that worked at the house mainly because of the strange nature of the house. People couldn't figure out what kept people working at the house for such long stretches of their career, often attributing it to them being bound to the house in some mystical way. But in reality, Sarah paid her staff very well, let them live in the mansion rent-free, and provided them with a steady job. Even if their workplace was pretty out of the ordinary, that still seems like a pretty good setup. They often had to deal with rooms being boarded up seemingly overnight and ever-changing architecture, which would be disorienting even if people didn't think the mansion was haunted. 
Staff reportedly saw Sarah Winchester pretty rarely, but the house was built in a way that she could be observing her staff without being seen. Anytime people did see Sarah, she was known to be dressed in all-black Victorian attire with a black veil covering her face. Which, I will give this one to the neighbors, it would be pretty ominous if you lived next door to a sprawling mansion with an owner that you never saw or spoke to, and you're just looking into the garden on a sunny California day, and the only glimpse you ever get of her is when she's fully dressed in black and her face is obscured by a funeral veil. That would be curious to say the least. Neighbors also reported often hearing distant organ music at the crack of dawn. It's safe to say that Sarah had bad insomnia and enjoyed passing the time by playing her massive pipe organ that she had put in the mansion. Sarah and the Winchester house definitely seem to have fallen victim to what is colloquially known as the Liberty Valance effect. Basically the idea that when legend becomes a fact in people's minds, print the legend. And this totally makes sense because the folklore surrounding the Winchester house is plentiful and fascinating, albeit often speculative. Plus, the Winchester Mystery House website makes a really good point that of course neighbors were going to think she was weird. She was doing things like buying property, traveling alone, spending money how she wanted to, you know, things that were unheard of for a woman to do at the time, but completely normal and expected of a man. Over time, anecdotal stories began to trickle out of the house, with accounts from ladies' maids about hauntings and paranormal activity. This just added more fuel to the gossip of neighbors. Probably the most notable story of absurdity and eccentricity is that of the Grand Ballroom. This is one of the most beautiful and impressive features in the house, though it's not the only ballroom, I think there are like three others throughout the property. However, this one was the most lavish. It was supposed to have cost upwards of $9,000 in the late 1800s, so I can't imagine what that would convert to by today's inflation rates. I guess she decided that at one point she wanted to have a grand ball and a dinner party. She hired musicians to play for the event, catered fine wine and food, and prepared for the ball. When the day of the ball finally came, the musicians showed up, the tables were set, and the night was ready to begin. It wasn't until the names of the guests started being announced for their entry did the musicians come to the troubling realization that nobody was coming, and that they were hired to play a completely empty room with no guests. Apparently, they fled in fear, and that was the last of the grand balls that were ever held at the Winchester house while Sarah was alive. Another infamous tale came from a parlor maid named Maggie Dubin, who got to see the seance room up close and personal. Sarah was known not to let staff into the seance room while she was using it, but one night, Maggie hid inside of the room as Sarah performed one of her nightly rituals. She apparently saw Sarah clutching a large urn, and Maggie was so frightened by this, she ran out of the room screaming. Other accounts include hearing the cries of a baby throughout the mansion. Let's dive a little bit deeper into the seance room. Sarah Winchester reportedly held seances in her seance room every night at midnight. The details of what exactly happened in that room were somewhat shrouded in mystery because of how private Sarah was. We do know, however, about the construction of the room. The seance room has many different corridors that lead into an area near the room, but only a couple of entrances and exits. Sarah was known to take different routes, almost like an obstacle course, every time she traveled to this particular room, because she never wanted the spirits in the house to know the specific route she was taking. One of the exits looks like a secret passageway, because the only way to access it is through a closet that leads into another room. When you're in this ants room, you can use the door handle to access this passageway, but not the other way around. That particular door only had a handle on the inside and could not be accessed from the outside. There were also hooks carefully placed on the wall, 13 of them, of course. 
As I had mentioned before, Sarah was known to do these seances every night alone in this room, but I think that might be an artifact of the gossip of the time. It was way more common for seances to be a more social event with multiple participants. Plus, why would you need 13 coat hooks if you were the only person in the room? So we'll never really know what went on in there. I mentioned before that a lot of these stories are only legends and local lore, but a frightening occurrence that we do know took place while Sarah was living in the house was the Great San Francisco Earthquake of 1906. The earthquake happened while Sarah was sleeping, and as the house began to crumble, she was nearly crushed to death. She was pulled from the rubble, ultimately unharmed, but much of the fourth floor, as well as the seven-story tower, were damaged and later demolished. There's actually a theory that some of those weird doors and stairs to nowhere might have been a relic of this earthquake. Instead of them being built explicitly to confuse ghosts and otherworldly house guests, they might have simply been parts of the house that were never changed after other parts of it were destroyed. Either way, Sarah Winchester was freaked out by this near-death experience, so for a short period of time, she moved out of the Winchester house and into another residence. It wasn't until 1912 she returned to the house to do a little more building. This is when a lot of people think the more chaotic designs begin to take over. But, like I said before, that could have very well been because they were trying to build around the parts of the house that the earthquake had partially destroyed. The passageways and doors that go nowhere were reminders of demolished wings of earthquake ruined dwellings. But try as one can, there is no excuse outside. The incredible sprawl of the hundreds. Hearts are dust. Hearts' love remains. To live in hearts we leave behind is not to die. Miles of corridors. In 1922, after nearly 40 years of living in and building the Winchester House, Sarah Winchester passed away in her sleep. Her niece, Marion Merriman, who had spent decades living with Sarah, inherited a great portion of her assets. Just a few months later, the Winchester house went up for auction. It was purchased by Mamie and John Brown, who had initially wanted the property to build a small theme park with a wooden roller coaster called the Backity Back, constructed by John Brown when the family was living in Canada. Once they realized that there was so much history behind the Winchester house, they pivoted making it into a museum where people could visit and learn about its mysterious construction and owner. Mamie Brown was the first official tour guide of the home and also opened up the gardens to the public for neighbors and visitors to picnic at. Around that same time, Harry Houdini visited the house on Halloween night of 1924, looking to get some answers about the infamous rituals that were performed, as well as to carry out a seance himself. He was also apparently the one who coined the term the Winchester Mystery House. And tour guides at the Winchester House claim that Houdini did not believe much in seances, but this one apparently shook his strong skepticism in some way and left him with more questions than answers. To this day, the Winchester Mystery House is open for tours, so you can go and decide for yourself whether or not it's actually haunted. As an added bonus, flashlight tours at night are given to really boost the fear factor. While I was researching the house, I stumbled upon a great Reddit AMA that was done by a former tour guide, and the general consensus seems to be that the house is indeed haunted. Anecdotes of other tour guides not wanting to go to certain floors, light bulbs that stay lit even after they're unscrewed, and sounds of footsteps were mentioned. The original poster also believed that the scariest part of the house was the servants' quarters on the third floor. If you're not in California or you don't want to make the trip, you can also get a better representation of the mansion from the 2018 film Winchester, with Helen Mirren starring as Sarah Winchester herself. The beginning of the movie is really helpful in showing the layout of the house because it was actually filmed there, and they do a great job of highlighting some of those ingenious elements that Sarah added to the house, like the call tubes and the shallow stairs that aided in her mobility when she suffered from arthritis. 
The movie itself isn't great and honestly kind of boring by the end, but the visuals are great. So now it's up to you to decide whether you think the house was full of spirits or just a beautiful relic of California history. Either way, Sarah Winchester and her mystery house will live in infamy for decades to come. This has been a transmission of Interstate Odyssey, Episode 2.